Well, let's open up the Word of God. We're actually, Alan introduced last uh, week, uh, our, we, we, for now we don't call them ser uh, series anymore. What do we call them? Seasons. seasons. He introduced our new season. Best I can figure, this one will last about 30 weeks. Uh, and then we'll call it something else and shift into another season, you know, kind of shift gears. Uh, but during this season, let me give you a little preview of what we're going to be doing. We are beginning at the earliest part uh, in chapter 4 of the book of Luke, and we are going to go through, and Sunday after Sunday, for about 30 Sundays, we're going to look at every encounter passage uh, in the gospel of Luke. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Because this is what happens. You read about it in the Word. It stirs your heart to faith, and then God does the same stuff in your midst. Amen? So the idea is we're just going to keep, and we're going to do it chronologically, so we're just going to kind of keep, you know, working our way in. And by the time we're done, uh, listen, I think things are going to be full-blown around here. I mean, I think it's going to be absolutely everything that the kingdom has to offer, we are going to be experiencing when we gather together and even when we go out there. Amen? But what we've got to do is we've got to allow the Word. See, there's something in us. There's something been woven into our psyche by the culture, by maybe families of origin, who knows, maybe by uh, bad church experience, but something has woven into us this unbelief that, that, that needs by the Spirit and the Word, it gets broken off. Amen? Amen. And so that's the purpose of what we're going to do. Amen. So you ready for that? Ready. All right. See, I ain't going to be the same. Be the All right. Good deal. All right. So who knows what that is besides Trevor? He cannot have a vote. Huh? Close? Huh? Staff? Bad, but not that. That's a, that's a flu germ. Now, it's not the current one going around because uh, I couldn't find the current picture. Now, the current one's bad. I mean, I don't mean to make light of this because I think the last I read, 97 children have died of the current strain of flu that's going around. Not to mention, you know, older people and so forth, so... Uh, but isn't it interesting that something so deadly can be so invisible? But now because we recognize the reality that there is such a thing, now you can call me paranoid or not. Um, somebody getting a call? Uh, but I don't know, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm washing my hands on a regular basis. Now, that's a problem for me because I have to then put lotion on them because it takes, it's taken years to get them this soft, and I'm not going to let... Uh, here, turn me. Isn't that good? Who am I talking about? Brother, those are some seriously soft hands. Come on, give me five. All right, so, you know, washing hands, doing lotion, right? And, uh, and also back to, you know, we got that thing out there. Who does not have any hand sanitizer? Anybody in the room not have any? Billy. <laughs> Heads up. You know, why are we doing that hand sanitizing? For something we can't even see. Because we know though we can't see it, it's real. Right. Right? right? And come on now, some people even resort to this. Now, I must admit, I don't. I'm of the opinion I'm going to risk it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to risk it. I mean, that's a pain I know I will get. The flu is, I don't know what the percentage is, but you know what I'm saying? I'm going to risk it and pray God be with me through it if it happens to hit me, right? And I'm more amenable to those things they squirt in your nose, although every picture I saw of those, everybody's going, oh, it's like it's worse than... Uh... But no, so what's my point? We cannot see this flu germ. But yet we know very well it is real and it is bringing sickness and it is bringing death throughout the nation. Now, I lay that foundation to say that's a really good picture into the realm of the demonic. Especially now, if you go to Africa, 
You wouldn't have any trouble convincing people of the reality of this unseen, but yet deadly and dangerous uh, demonic world, would you? But in America, because we have been enlightened, uh, somehow even those of us sometimes who believe, it's like we see it through such a dark uh, glass that we're just not even that, you know, it's almost like, yeah, that's my theology. But is your theology hitting the road? Right? Is the rubber hitting the road with your theology, right? And so we need, to, we need our theology, we need the tires to actually hit the road because it's real. Because here's the fact, whether we like it or not, whether it's fun to talk about or not, there are people in this room and families in this room whose lives have been and are being destroyed because of something they cannot see. But it is deadly and it is real. Now here's the good news. The kingdom of God has been released on the earth to deal a blow, a death blow ultimately to that dark kingdom. We have the privilege of moving in the authority that will one day even take death itself and make it bow the knee to the Jesus, the King of Kings. Someday death itself is going to bow the knee. You and I have the privilege right now of moving in that very same authority against this unseen kingdom of darkness that's wreaking havoc all around us. Amen? Amen? So that's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to be looking at, uh, uh, at beginning in uh, uh, Luke uh, 4.31. Now here's a, here just an interesting little tidbit. You, you know that Jesus went about healing physical bodies, and uh, on several occasions he raised people from the dead, right? Now, if you look in the Old Testament, that happened in there too, Right? But what didn't happen in the Old Testament, uh, at least as far as I can find, is nobody was individually delivered from demonic bondage. It was new with the advance of the kingdom that is now at hand. It was something new. And, and so now people were doing, um, they, they were actually doing um, um, deliverance. But it was this kind of negotiating kind of deliverance with no authority at all. But Jesus shows up on the scene and he brings with him the authority of another thing that's not seen. But is very real. The kingdom of his father. So we begin to read in verse 31... And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching. For his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority, say this with me, For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Amen. 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 Now, let me just do a little quick overview uh, of New Testament theology about this thing. Now, Mark 1 is actually the story that we're reading and we're going to go into today. The same story is in Mark 1. And the same follow-up event that happens in Luke happens in Mark chapter 1. I'm just going to read it from Mark. So that evening, after what we just read about, that very same evening after that, so this would have been that, that, that evening, that evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and, and what? Cast out many demons. Guess what the word means in Greek? Many. 
Then we go on just a wee bit further. And then he went throughout all Galilee preaching in their synagogues and doing what? Casting out demons. Uh, then we find, and this is actually that time uh, halfway through the, uh, his ministry on earth or so when John the Baptist began to question. I'm not so sure if this is the guy I thought he was or not. Sends word asking. And at that very moment when John's messengers show up, it says, In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. Now, in Mark 6, it, uh, it, it actually, this is the disciples, the 12. Everybody say the 12. The 12. He, 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 they watch him. He, they, they learn by seeing him. Uh, and then at some point in Mark 6, he sends them out. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out how many demons? Many. many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And then going back to Mark uh, chapter 1. And the crowds with one accord paid attention. I'm sorry, this is actually uh, Acts. You notice what I do is I copy one and once in a while it catches me. So this is Philip in Acts, right? So what I want you to do is see Jesus went about everywhere casting out how many demons? Many. many. And then what happened when he sent out the 12? They cast out what? Many. many. Now what I want you to see is now we shift into Acts when it's uh, the New Testament church now been baptized in the power of the Spirit. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of what? Many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame and healed. Now, there are seven, in the Gospels, there are seven individual accounts of Jesus driving out demonic spirits from individual people, right? Seven, now I guarantee you they were a lot more than that. But they, the Scripture gives us seven. We're going to look at five of those, including the one today. Because how many of you know these seven were recorded for a purpose? So that the church can be instructed. Jesus, see, what, what, what those disciples didn't realize, and some church people don't realize even today, the New Testament is not just a history book. It's an instruction manual. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is not a history that we're reading about something that happened, wonderful happened back 2,000 years ago. This is something that was recorded for the body of Christ so that generation after generation after generation after generation of believers could deal with this unseen yet deadly diabolical world that is wreaking havoc on humanity. You see that? I just put this in there because it's one of my favorites. I'm not sure it's adding anything to your knowledge base today, but I love it. Uh, see, I think sometimes we kind of get this picture of Jesus trotting around with 12 guys. And you've not read this, and there was some women hanging out with Jesus. You understand that? Uh, soon afterwards, he went and through the cities proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of what? Evil spirits and infirmities, and I love this part. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. She got the volume discount. <laughs> I mean, I just love that. I say, something about this little insight into the reality of this tribe. And the reason I think that's important, I'm going to... I'm gonna, I'm going to touch on this a little bit more because I'm going to tell you one thing we're going to do as a church is we're getting rid of the stigma that seems to be associated with, ha with having some kind of demonic uh, oppression in, in your life. We're getting rid of the stigma. The truth is you've all either had it or you currently have it. None of us escaped it. The good news is if we'll come to terms with this and begin to allow the kingdom of God to advance in our life and through our lives, what was once a stigma and a point of shame now becomes a badge of honor. Yeah. You understand? Uh, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons have gone out. 
That is, there's no shame in that. Do you see that? That is nothing but a badge of honor to the kingdom of God in a yielded woman's life. Can somebody in the room say hallelujah? Hallelujah. I'm making up a new word today. Somebody write that down so we don't forget it. Hallelujah. Very good. You heard it here first. All right. That's what happens when you get so excited. I must admit, I mean, I know this is strange. And I know we're in a new season. I can tell it shifted. I can feel it. I can just feel it. It's just like a whole, you know, it's just like being thrown in waters. You get to swim in now, and there's no net there to catch your fingers in. You know, I, I know that. And, and I know you should not be excited about teaching about demons in the church. I know that. But I am. <laughs> I am. I can't help myself because some of us are just about to get set radically free. Some of our lives are never, ever going to be the same. Listen, my brother Scott McHugh sitting right there. I still remember the day about five years ago right here in this very spot. He came up to me after a service, looked me in the eyes and said, you will never suffer under uh, that bondage of depression again. And I haven't. I haven't. Now, what was that about? That was the kingdom of God coming to say, time's up, spirit of depression. Come on. That's, my, that's one of my badge of honors. All right. Now, here's my point. I said all of that because I want to get us into this one statement together in faith. If you take the New Testament seriously, as a book that reveals what is real and true about human experience and God's kingdom in the earth, you have no choice but to accept demonic activity as a very present reality, a reality that must be challenged. Can somebody get on board with me with this? Amen? I tell you what, come on. Now, anybody, any of, any of you ancient folk know what this is? Huh? JC, I can always count on you, sister. Yeah, 1973, a movie came out called The Exorcist. Does anybody remember that movie? That was, I don't think I saw it. I wasn't saved. And I mean, I wasn't even saved. And I thought, I don't know, that doesn't sound like a good idea to me. <laughs> And then I heard about it, and I thought, dang, that was a good call, because you know, I've got soft hands, and I also get scared at night for that kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, and you know, and that, I mean, that whole twisted head going around, and blah, and blah, and all the, the body fluids, man, that is like, <laughs> right? So, I mean, so you get this paint, out. I mean, so America's like, I mean, we hadn't even talked about demon, demonic stuff in America up until that point. So our baptism of fire uh, and training in theology is what? The exorcist. The exorcist. <laughs> now, I'm not saying some of that stuff couldn't happen. I am saying this. None of that stuff happened in the New Testament that we can read. The worst we read in the New Testament is the guy with the legion of demons, and that turned out pretty well in a short period of time. Amen. As far as I can tell, his head didn't spin and he didn't, you know, I don't, you know. So anyway, my point is this. We're changing our theology from the, the, uh, the, uh, the seminary of the exorcist to the seminary of the New Testament. Amen. We're going to let that form our theology. So the passage we're looking at today uh, in Luke 4.33, in the synagogue there was a man who had, a, had the spirit of an unclean demon. That's literally what it says in, in the Greek. Now the reason it says that, it's never described that way again in all of the New Testament. But the reason Luke did that is very simple. Up until this point, he has continually talked about the spirit meaning the Holy Spirit. And so here he's about to shift into a, another gear where this Holy Spirit uh, uh, empowered Jesus is about to encounter another kind of spirit. And so he just wants to make sure everybody's clear. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about the kind that baptized him uh, down there in the Jordan River now. We're talking about another kind of spirit. It's unclean and it's demonic, Right? And then he never uses that terminology again, all of it. Because it's kind of clumsy term, term, terminology. So I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help me out, frankly. 
Sometimes I rewrite the scripture so I can understand it, right, with my limited grasp of the English language. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had an unclean demon spirit. That's a little easier to read. And it's very accurate to what, what Luke was saying. But I want to draw your attention to the simple little word, had. You see that? Now, that same word, Greek and English, is used in Mark 3.10. He, he had healed many so that all who had diseases, you got that? Now, this is really important. It's kind of a fine theological point maybe, but I think it's a really important one that we get from the get-go as a, as a, as a church body. You know, if you get the flu and get over it, you can look back and say, I had the flu. You don't say the flu had me. I had a cold, but I got better. You don't say the cold had me for seven to ten days. You understand? So let's get our theology right. Because the Bible is not talking about demons having somebody. It's talking about the, the, the somebody having a germ and, in, and, 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 and they've been infested with something, right? Are you tracking with me? This is important. Now, there's another term that's used uh, uh, in the New Testament 12 times. And in the ESV, it's always, always rendered oppressed by demons. And, uh, and, and this is what this says. That evening at sundown, we looked at this. They brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. That's actually one Greek word, uh, and it means to be demonized or to be under the influence or power of a demon. Now, you, you're thinking, this is too fine a point. Oh, you wait a minute. You, 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 you. Derek Prince says this, the Greek word conveys no suggestion of ownership. Somebody in this room needs to hear this. But merely means to subject to demonic influence. That is really good. And then he goes, follows that up with a quote I wanted to add in here because uh, we, and if you don't have time to write this down and you want it, you contact me, I'll give it to you. Obviously, the form of words we use is of vital importance. It is one thing to say to a person, you are subject to demonic influence. It is quite another to say you are possessed by a demon. And here's the point. In New Testament Greek language, nowhere in any way does it really say anybody was possessed or owned by a demon. Go back and study it in the Greek and you'll find that's true. That's really important. Especially if you're ministering to somebody. Because that's a, that's a long country to try to travel from in faith if you are sitting here thinking you are somehow owned and possessed by someone. It's a very different thing if you're right here and you say to that person, listen, you are suffering under a powerful influence, but it doesn't own you. And the minute you bow the knee to Jesus, even the influence begins to crack and crumble. Do you see that? This is really, really a fine point, but an incredibly important point. And, and frankly, for some of you in this room, you need to hear that today. Now, now let me do a real quick, you know, like as quick as I do quick, right? Some of you chuckle because I don't always do quick, quick. But, but it's important to kind of get a picture of what does this look like. Well, I see this whole thing of demonic influence uh, on, a, on this continuum, beginning on this far end with temptation. Now, anybody in the room not ever been tempted? Of course, we've all been tempted. We've been tempted to do this or to do that, to give up. I mean, the, the, you know, so we all suffer under this. We're in this world, and, and, and frankly, the, the job description of the demonic realm is to tempt people and to even to tempt Christians, right? So we know that's a reality we learn to live with, and we learn to resist it. Part of growing in the faith is when we learn to resist temptation, we begin to grow and mature in the faith. But then there's this other, about midway, I would call it, I would call this oppression. Now we've shifted to where before you've got this temptation trying to invite you into something, and now something actually, it's just almost like a cloud settles over you, right? 
And when the temptation comes under that cloud, you almost have the feeling that you have no choice. Right. Uh, anybody ever been there? I know. Ex listen, I, this is theology, but it's personal experience. I know what it feels like. I know what it's like to be under that oppression and to have the enemy then in that place come and tempt me. And I knew, I, I, you know, I just got to surrender. Do I, do I surrender now or do I fight it for an hour and then surrender? Later on, I looked back and realized, oh, I see. I was under this oppression. Uh, once I came out from under that, then I'm back to I can deal with the temptation. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if you travel further down the line to the I'm trying to I'm trying to get 60 minutes of sermon out in 35 minutes here, so I'm moving. If you move all the way down to the line, you get to the place that, and we'll look at this guy in coming weeks, the guy who had the legion of demons. Uh, he was dominated by that demonic infestation and literally was almost like a puppet, I would say like a puppet on a string. They didn't own him, but they sure had brought his life experience to a level of domination. So do you see that? Now, so this is, this is what, what I want to point out kind of as uh, launching into this, and then we'll do another four. It, it'll be over the next while. It's not next week, so you can come back safely. But oh, sometime in the next 30 weeks, we'll look at four more uh, 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 teachings from the New Testament. Luke, see wh where this circle is? Oppression and domination. When it talks about Jesus going in the power of the kingdom and bringing deliverance and setting people free, that's what it's talking about. Right? All right. So what form does this oppression or domination take? We're going to do this very quickly. Uh, by the way, pay attention because I do believe uh, this is by no means ex in all inclusive. I'm telling you that you wouldn't have time, nor would I, of the forms that it can take. But I do believe the Holy Spirit pointed me out some forms that it is taking uh, in some of you in this room today, right? Um, depression. I've already used my personal example. Now, I'm going to say this so I don't have to say it about the rest of the stuff. With depression, there is a physiological component. There is a component of the mind, will, and emotions. And then there is a demonic component. I'm talking about this, which influences all of it. I'm not talking about the physiological. The healing for that really is um, uh, healing. You know, it's just a physiological thing, and the brain needs to be touched and healed, right? So, but what I am talking about now is uh, uh, demonic oppression and domination can come in these forms. Uh, it can come in compulsive fear. It can come in sexual perversion, uh, anger and rage, uh, compulsive disorders, Gender confusion, financial poverty, fear of not having enough. I suffered under that one for years until the Lord set me free. And it was only after the fact I realized I was actually under oppression. I thought I was battling temptation, but it was oppression. Uh, addictions fall into this. Relational dysfunction. If you find yourself, no matter what, you just, I mean, you just can't get relationships to work. There's a real probability that you're under some cloud of oppression or even domination, and it is now really like driving the, the car of your life. Uh, compulsive sexual immorality, uh, physical or sexual abuse, uh, rejection, and then last but not least, of course, some sickness and disease. Now, one of the things that's interesting as we go through this study together is there are times... Jesus is not even navigating the fine hairs of this. He's dealing, he'll just deal with a, a, a spirit of infirmity and get rid of the infirmity at one fell swoop. Or he may de de deal with the disease, and if there was a demonic thing associated with it, it's got to go too. He wasn't splitting hairs. He was just advancing the kingdom. The reason it's important for us to look at it is so that we understand all that's in included in, in this thing. Now, what is the source of demonic oppression? I'm going to run through this like really quickly just so you get a taste of it. We'll go in more depth in some of the final um, uh, f future teachings we look at. But one, of course, is personal sin. You remember that temptation being the first? 
If somebody stays in that and begins to yield repeatedly to a temptation, eventually they will find themselves coming under oppression in that area. And eventually, if that stays, it can go to domination, right? Another that you may not think is fair, but it's a reality, is traumatic events. In fact, some spirits of fear enter in uh, uh, through traumatic events. Generational transmission is major. It's big. Something that's been in your family line, it, it will just keep coming down the family line until somebody in the authority of the kingdom of God stands up and says, it stops here with me. It is not going to continue into my children and grandchildren. Hallelujah. Do you understand that? That's a major one. And then another one is cultural stuff. Some of the stuff we deal with, it's just we've lived in this culture, and it's kind of taken hold. So, now, demonic oppression and domination. Sickness and disease. Captivity to sin. If you read the New Testament, the gospel accounts, what you'll find is by and large, now we've got a little raising of the dead here, we got a little uh, multiplying of food over here, we got a little uh, looking at storms and saying be still over here, but the vast majority of the work of Christ in terms of the kingdom advancing, if you'll notice, is done in these three areas. Right? Now, Sometimes you're only dealing with captivity to sin and it's, you're not under a demonic oppression. You just simply need the gospel and be set free in that area. But there is a captivity of sin that can actually be so strong and reinforced because it actually, I put the one on top because it, can, it, it influences all of it and sometimes it can reinforce it in a major way. Does that make sense? Now, Notice what uh, Peter gives a little report on the ministry of Jesus uh, uh, at Cornelius' house. And he says, you know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And how he went about doing good and what? Healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil. Because God was with him. Now, back to Luke 4. That was the introduction. Yeah, you're going to get a 25-minute 20, introduction to 15-minute sermon. You ready? What leads in to what we begin to read in verse 31 starts in Luke 4.18. Jesus stands up, takes the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads this about himself. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now notice, if we go back to where we started today, they were astonished when Jesus comes in this authority that we just read he's prophesied about himself. And he begins to... Now we don't know what he shared that day. We don't know what words were coming out of him. We don't know what he was teaching. There's a likelihood he began with that very prophecy out of Isaiah, declaring, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, right? Uh, and, and then moved in. Whatever it was he said that day, the people there were astonished at his teaching for his word, for what he was saying, what was coming out of his mouth, possessed authority. Luke 4.18. Now, what is authority? The Greek word and the English word, it's the same definition. So I'm going with English. The power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. Got that? Now, where does that come from? Look at that. I'm getting a little trigger happy here. I think I got overly. Man, it was do I was doing so good. Do you see that? You see what I just circled in our little box? 
He has anointed me. Read that with me. He has sent me. Where does the authority come from? The one who sends. Now, we won't go into it today, but that last night before his crucifixion, Jesus looked at the guys in the, 12, uh, the, the 11 by that time and said, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Now, in the synagogue, there was this guy who cried out. I just, um, I hope, um, here, there we go. You see that little word, ha? If you, if you pick 50 uh, New Testaments in English versions, you're going to have nearly 50 different translations of that word. You know why? There's not an English word to translate this. Because it's not so much a word as it is a reaction. It's an exclamation indicating surprise, ind indignation, fear, or anger, or any combination of the two. There we go. Oh my. It could, that works. Oh my! Who else had another verbal reaction? Yuck! That works. Now, some, some of you can't say the one that came to your mind. I was thinking, I was thinking about that. And I, uh, I mean, you know, come on, think about it. This, the, the, the picture in the New Testament is this. This, the, the demonic realm in general and this demon specifically, they've just been going about their merry way forever. And suddenly, they're in this room. In this synagogue, they just come to church for another day. This is going to be good, another good day at church. And they're sitting there, and suddenly this guy begins to speak. And the authority of heaven begins to invade the room like it's a cloud or a fog. It begins to invade the place. And the, and the demonic, I mean, he starts thinking, oh, dear, what, what is this? Until finally he's like me running up on a rattlesnake. Though I will admit if I ran up on a green snake, there would be no differentiation for me. I mean, if I were run up on a worm and think it's a snake, i get the same reaction, Right? But I want you to see this. That's the reaction. I mean, what you, what you got to understand is what we're reading about in Luke was the demonic realm. Other than Jesus in that wilderness with Satan, this is the first encounter of the demonic realm with, the, with Jesus and the kingdom of heaven that is now at hand. And it scared the devil out of him, so to speak. That's important. Come on. And then he, he kind of captures himself, I think. <laughs> So what was yours? Oh, my. Oh, my. What have you to do with us? And then I think he composes himself a little bit, realizing, wait a minute, I'm a demon. I'm not supposed to act like this. Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. Do you know what's going on there? See, in the understanding of this whole demon world at that time, the key to authority was knowing the name. Understanding something of the nature so that you could then exercise authority over them. So here, this is the first time it's happened. I doubt they tried to play that card too many times once the news got out. <laughs> this guy don't yield to this stuff. But my guess is at this moment, this was one attempt at doing something the devil has been doing in your life and my life since we've been born again. Trying to unnerve us. Lie to us. Who do you think you are? Well, it's about time we, like Jesus, uh, just go on and say, be silent and come out of him. Be silent and get out of my car. Be silent and leave me alone. Get out of my prayer room. Be silent. Now, you know what that word, be silent? I love this little. I love the, it, it means to close the mouth with a muzzle. I will give you a visual of that one. <laughs> little, little dogs don't get a bad rap. They are that bad. You owners of little dogs, they are that bad. Yep, 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 yep. Muzzle it. <laughs> you understand Jesus in the synagogue that day. That's what happened. 
this demonic power kind of pulls itself together and, th- and comes back to try to gain some, regain his authority in the room. This is his synagogue, by the way. And Jesus, you know what he said literally? Muzzle it! That's what he said. Muzzle it! Now, some of you came to church today to learn those two words. And you can leave now. You got them. Oh, but in case you need some more visual image. And I felt that one, you know, he just kind of looks like, man, I used to rule the world and look at me now. (laughs) And this is my favorite. It was like, man, I used to be this ferocious beast and my bark would shin shivers up the spine of any man, woman, or child and look at me now. By the way, this one had a caption with it. I think I got it off of Flickr. It's legal, by the way. Bob's new look. (laughs) I tell you what, friends, listen to me. If you will allow the kingdom of God to do what has been released in the earth to do in your life and through your life, you're going to get a new look. And people around you are going to get new looks because the demonic realm that has ruled the roost and lives long enough, it's time for them to shut up and be muzzled and we have the authority through the name of Jesus Christ, the risen one, to say that very thing. Come on, somebody. Oh, I tell you. And, and then he goes on and he says, and come out of him. You know what I love about this is the absolute brevity and simplicity of it. We don't need to wrestle with this stuff. Only two things need to be known. One is we, know, we need to know that we're actually dealing with a demonic spirit. That's really the only thing we really need to know as long as we already know. And I have all authority to look at that thing and say, you shut your mouth, you muzzle it. And you come out. You cannot have me. I love in the Greek it's only two words. Go out, come out, depart from. Pick your terminology. It all means the same. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with what? Authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Authority we've already looked at. The power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. Say that with me. The power Now that's going to scare the devil out of the devil right there. I'll tell you right now, I I felt him shake. (laughs) Now listen. (laughs) Soft hands are good. <laughs> Being scared at night's okay. But don't you go weak on, on uh, dealing with the, with the demonic realm. Let's practice our strong voice, folk. Authority. Authority. Start it over. Get it all. Just keep saying it over and over. Go on, start it over. That's good. (laughs) That's what I'm talking about. But it it has a partner called dunamis power. And this means force, power. It's from the Greek word which means to be able. Now Jesus died, rose again, was taken up to the right hand of the Father, waited until the appropriate time and must have looked at one another and said, this is it. Holy Spirit, be poured out and released and empowered the church. Church has been in power for 2,000 years. Now you and I need to get under the spout of that empowering and allow the Holy Spirit to empower us. But I'm telling you, there's nobody in the room disqualified from being empowered by the Holy Spirit. As Elizabeth and we talked about in prayer, you already have the authority because that comes from the blood of Jesus. 
I love what Randy Clark says. He does a little training on the demonic, and he is a unique guy. I mean, he? he's just a fun guy to like watching. Um, I mean, I've never seen anybody with such a light spirit get so much result because he just he just owns it. But this is what he says: If you spot them, you got them. Why? Why does he say that? Because he knows. That the church who understands they have authority, the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience, and has experience and understands that they are empowered by the Holy Spirit with a power from on high, the church or the person who understands that, all they need to be able to know is what they're looking at. So how can demonic oppression or domination be detected. We're going to finish with this. It's an odd place to stop, I think. And Alan, if you want to grab the mic, I'm just going to run through these and hand it to you. The presence of kingdom authority forces it to the surface as in today's passage. See, one of the things we need to understand is the demonic's greatest weapon is deception and hiddenness. And so what happens is you get into uh, an environment where the Holy Spirit is, is present uh, and there is some level of anointing. Many times that thing is forced out of its hiding place. In some cases in a loud way and in other cases just that the individual knows it. It's very possible that's happened today in this room. And can I tell you something that we started with? That's to be celebrated, not ashamed of. That's a glorious, glorious thing, not something to like be, be a, a, a ashamed of. Now, secondly, dysfunction or repeated failure in an area of life is an indicator of possible demonic activity. Uh, it can be revealed through the spiritual gift of discernment. And then fourth, the Holy Spirit can reveal it to the individual. So Alan's going to introduce us. We're going to be uh, back in our prayer pods and um, Amen. Can I, can I pray something real yes, quick? Yes, please. So Father we are so grateful for the Word of God. We're so grateful for the New Testament. We're grateful to be able to read how you advanced your kingdom in the earth. And we're grateful you've never stopped for 2,000 years. And I'm asking that you would take the truth of your word and you would bring freedom in this room today where freedom is needed. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will. And we have our prayer spots or pods, we've called them. There'll be an elder there. Uh, if you'd like to receive prayer, we do invite you to go there. If there's somebody uh, there, just you can just stand around there and wait. And uh, as we have prayer, we're, we're given a, uh, an opportunity where it can be undisturbed prayer. We can sit down, look at each other. We just felt this is the way the Holy Spirit would have us present a prayer. We're trying to ask the title of this season is thy kingdom come and we're truly wanting to engage the power of the kingdom so we're being very uh we're trying to have a great intention of of totally doing that in these prayer uh, spots these prayer pods if you will i also said last week if uh, there'll be an elder there and if you'd like to help in prayer that's that is made available but not today i didn't put that in last week we have training uh, that you can see one of the elders, probably uh, Trevor Craig. There'll be a time of training when you can pray with the elders as we, as we go through this. So we're going to sing a worship song together. Uh, the, the sermon, uh, we're cutting them short, about 10 minutes or so for a time of prayer. After uh, the, it's kind of closed so everybody can leave, it doesn't mean that the prayer stops. It doesn't mean the worship stops. It just means that you'll be able to go. Those that uh, would like to, you can, but those that want to stay, you're welcome to stay. Because sometimes we're praying for the kingdom to come. 
we must linger in prayer. Amen. So let's worship now. So Lord Jesus, uh, be with us as our prayer. And we ask and pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would move upon all of us in here. And uh, for those that should go for prayer, we ask and pray that they would be released by your Spirit. And they would, um, they would just seek you and your kingdom in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Your prayer could be a lot of different reasons. It could be physical or spiritual, mental. It could be financial. Uh, you just allow the Spirit of God to move you. Let's worship just a moment. When you speak, darkness has to bow. Confusion has its final rise and fall you tear down every wall around me when you speak you breathe upon the dust you come alive in us when you speak you silence every
We also want to extend an invitation. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, if, that's, if that message is even confusing to you, we do invite you to come up. And uh, I, myself, or uh, we have several here, we can talk with you and explain to you what it means to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior of your life. And also, it is our prayer that... Uh, I just encourage you for, for physical healing, for mental anguish, for sleepless nights, for infection, for blood infection. Let's just bow our heads just a second. If you'd like uh, prayer for some type of infection with every head bowed, I closed. I'm just going to ask that if you need prayer for some type of infection, just slip your hand up right quickly. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, and I just felt like uh, like an arthritis, a a type of arthritic uh, uh, pain. Just raise your hand right quickly, please. Right quickly. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, now this one's weird, but I felt like night cramps, night cramps. Uh, right, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Um, this one is is like a, a pain in your left hand, but it's your thumb pain of your left okay that's your thumb that's right okay we're gonna pray for that okay Lord Jesus these that raise their hands on these physical illnesses we ask and pray by the authority that's in the name of Jesus Christ which now sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Lord God, we ask and pray that as we're all raised together into these heavenly places, we pray that your kingdom will come and we ask for healing in all of these areas, all of these physical infirmities, disease, illness. We ask and pray for healing. And dear Heavenly Father, any of it that's caused by demonic oppression or dominion or whatever, by the power of the name of Jesus, based on the authority of this word that was preached today, we cast them out in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Lord Jesus, for some here, oh God, have uh, some older children, 20s and 30s, that are away from you, and they have a heavy, heavy, heavy heart. Uh, If that's you, raise your hand. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Just all over the building. So, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, by the authority that's in the name of Jesus, which is over all principalities and powers, all of that demonic oppression and influence as a church, as a church, oh God, We just call the prodigals home. We call those that are not born again home. We, all of these loved ones, they're they're in the hearts. They're in the hearts. This compassion and passion that they have for these children. I ask and pray for the kingdom of God to come upon their passion of the parent for the children or for the nieces and nephews. We ask and pray, oh God, that your kingdom would come to these situations. To these situations, oh God, that your kingdom would come. Dear God, just one word from you changes everything. Just a little bit of your light, oh God, reveals everything. When your way and your light comes, just one word from you changes everything. Dear God, we do ask and pray 
that you'll come and that you'll have your way. That you'll have your way. That you'll come, oh God. Now you're everything we see as deep cries out to Dear Heavenly Father, by the power that's in the name of Jesus, we bless this congregation. We bless it, O oh God, and they're coming in here. We bless them, O oh God, and they're leaving from here. We ask and pray, O oh God, that the very fact of us being here together as a congregation, that we have been influenced, totally influenced, by your kingdom. Let everyone leave from here in the power of of the name of Jesus, we pray, oh God. Amen and amen. And we'll worship you. We worship you. If you want more prayer, just go to the prayer pods, please. We have several prayer pods open. One right over here beside the sound booth, I think. One in the corner. If you will, shut the doors at the back, please, so we can, we want to keep an attitude of prayer in here in the sanctuary of worship and of prayer, if you will. So please be an intercession while we're in here. We don't want to turn this into a, to, we don't keep the presence of worship in here. Thank you. Lord Jesus, be with those that are getting prayer right now. We're in agreement with this prayer, O oh God, that's taking place right at this time. We ask and pray, O oh God, that you will, will be done in these situations. Let it be done, O oh God. Let your kingdom come. Stay in intercession and stay in prayer. We want this to be a sanctuary of intercession, a sanctuary of prayer. If you want to visit, that's good. We just ask you to go on out in the far foyer as we pray for those that need prayer. Lord Jesus, we're asking and praying for your kingdom. We're asking and praying for miracles. We're asking and praying, oh God, that this is your house. This is your sanctuary. That your kingdom can come to this earth. 
on earth as it is in heaven. We ask and pray, oh God, that your Holy Spirit would fall over all of these prayer pods. That your Holy Spirit would fall upon these prayer pods. As people are sharing their hearts, we're believing. We're believing.